augmentation, recent worsening augmentation, recent worsening augmentation. She currently takes Benacazil, 5 milligrams, once daily. And a week ago, her family started her giving her over-the-counter diphenhydramine, or insomnia. She has been constipated for four days. Physical exam reveals an uncooperative patient with descended urinary bladder. I have there are the labs there for you, and looking at the answer choices, each of the following is an appropriate next step, except which one?
Keep your mouth open. Okay. That's fine. I need my strap. With the chorea disorder, the constant range of eye movements, patients either are unaware or underestimate how bad their movement disorders are. Whereas patients with tardive dystonia are very much aware of their syndrome. Sorry, she has these involuntary movements of her arms, particularly her left arm. But the major problem here was the arm and axial dystonia so that she's leaning backwards. Just going by itself, huh? Can you hold your hands up in front of you? Both hands? During this entire time, her psychosis was completely controlled. But they weren't able to find any other medications that could treat her. And she was intolerant of her surfing that induced the severe depression. She was placed on clozapine, which actually did nothing at all for her movement disorder. And the rationale for using clozapine was to allow this passive healing business and also hopefully to treat the tardive dystonia, but it really didn't treat the tardive dystonia. But when we added for surfing, she was able to tolerate it this time. And she became dramatically, dramatically better. This 76-year-old woman has a two-year history of tardive orofacial stereotypies related to an eight-year treatment of chronic nausea with phenothiazines. How old are you? Seventy-seven. And what is it that's bothering you the most? My mouth. How long have you had a bounce with your mouth? Well, I guess about a year and a half. How long? About a year and a half. Okay.
patient with an antipsychotic, you want to use the atypical agents or the newer generation, which is these right here, betiapine, nolanzapine, adipristol, and spurdone. For the elderly, betiapine is a preferred one because a lot of the times they have Parkinson's, and this patient did have Parkinson's, and with betiapine, it does not, this drug does not exacerbate that movement disorder, or it has very minimal effects, while the other ones can just make it worse. So again, a typical antipsychotic for the treatment of agitation delirium, and in this case, they had started her on haloperidol, which is a typical one, the typical one. Kind of hard to say who's like this one. So, so the first generation basically, and we want to steer away from those because of that EPS. As I explained with the dopamine blockade issue, that is more severe with the older generation agents. All right, let's talk about anxiety. So, again, assess the patient's uh, whole clinical picture before you try agents. When it comes to an anxiety, it's very important that you establish daily routine and that these patients get some scheduled quiet time. Um, you, you wouldn't think how effective this is, but I've seen it. I worked in a psychiatric facility for three years and they had a time in which they would just either read or just be by themselves <coughs> in the patio, whatever it was, just schedule quiet time. And you would see like the reductions in medication use. It's very effective. <coughs> But if, it's, if these non-pharmacological options don't help and you must go to medication, so the first sign is going to be selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There are other options, such as the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, SNRI. And then if those don't work, then the last line is, would be your benzodiazepine. However, you want to stay away from this for all the reasons that I've talk, talked to you about today. So SSRIs. What are they? They're indicated for depression, chronic general anxiety, panic and obsessive compulsive disorder. And here's some examples. You have sertraline, fluoxetine, excitalopram, citalopram. Have you guys heard about, about these drugs in TV commercials? Yeah. They're, they're very new to the market. Um, not as, I mean, TCAs are kind of old. SNRIs are also used However, SNRIs can be used for other reasons, and I'll talk about them later, for other indications, such as neuropathic pain. And then there are other medications that work as anti-lytics, such as Fusepirone. Um, it works like a, as an SSRI, however, it, does, it also has affinity for dopamine receptors. And just be careful with this in practice. This is called Fusepirone. Fuse There's an, an, a drug out there, an antidepressant called Bupropion, and it works completely different. So don't mix those two. So some of the things to watch out with SSRIs when you start your patient on these is um, they may cause hyponatremia or ex exacerbate SIADH. What are some symptoms of hyponatremia? When they're severe, yeah, seizures. What else? <coughs> There's nausea, headache, confusion. Think about confusion. If you have a patient's daughter say, you know, he's been acting really confused, and then you think like, oh, they're elderly, maybe they have some sort of dementia going on, then there's a the prescribing cascade issue. You're gonna put them on some sort of medication. So try to try to look at the side effects of these medications too. And even though it has potential for side effects, like insomnia or somnolence, depending on which agent we're talking about, and constipation, it has a better side effect profile than benzos, which is why they're preferred they're a little bit more tolerable, and most of the time they have a lot less uh, drug interactions with the CYP415 metabolism. They're also first line for depression. So if you have a patient that uh, has chronic anxiety and depression, here you're killing two birds with one stone. So you can use one drug for two indications. Benzodiazepines. So we talked about this. So here they're used in the setting of an acute anxiety. They can also be used for seizures and alcohol withdrawal. Uh, they are short acting and long acting. And we talked about the metabolism of these phase one versus phase two. 
Do you guys remember which phase we want? Which one is not altered in the elderly? Or there's not much change, phase one or phase two? Phase two. So glucuronization. So you want to um, pick lorazepam to temazepam. There's a little acronym that we use in school. Well, well, when I was in school, I still feel like I'm in school. L O T, lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam. And these are the ones that you want to use in people with hepatic impairment because they're, they're, they use a phase two pathway and this is not as impaired in the elderly. So notice this, 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 this uh, big sign right here. Benzodiazepines increase the risk of fall in the elderly. So what happens when you fall and you're 70 years old you break your bones and then if you break your bones you're in the hospital if you're in the hospital you're at increased risk for infections and not just any infections multi-drug resistant infections and then there are a high risk of staying in the hospital longer for this infection and even dying so think about that they're also a controlled substance which means they have potential for dependence I do have a little mistake here. Would require taper to discontinue to prevent withdrawal. So if you use this for longer than four weeks, they will develop <coughs> some sort of dependence and then you would have to taper the regimen down little by little in order to discontinue and prevent withdrawal effect. As needed prescription often leads to daily use. So let's say you just tell them, well, I'll just write it for, you know, take one tablet as needed once in a while. That's not what they're going to do because when you take it, they're gonna like it and they're gonna like the way they feel on it. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use them, try not to prescribe more than two weeks. Stay below two weeks. And remember, use the short acting unless otherwise indicated. All right, moving on to depression. So depression <coughs> is very common in the elderly. And it's really important that you actually do treat the depression in the elderly because they'll stop eating, they'll stop doing their daily activities, they'll stop moving around. And if they are in pain, depression can... Question? Are we able to prescribe benzos? I don't think you're not, but you're, you're allowed to prescribe around to the doctor if he finds it, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, in indirectly you can. Oh. Maybe one day you will, who knows? Um, so you do want to treat depression in this population <coughs> because if you don't, they'll, they'll, um, they'll end up in the hospital due to malnutrition and uh, other issues or decreased mobility and function. As I mentioned before, SSRIs are the drug of choice to treat depression. Now, TCA, previously used, However, they have a lot of anticholinergic side effects and cardiovascular effects. So let's say with the SSRIs, if you have a patient on a TCA, why not transition them over to one of the newer, better agents? All right, pain. When it comes to pain, it's really important that you actually do try physical therapy E and I. You want to avoid narcotic analgesics because they cause delirium, they cause confusion, they, they cause increased risk of fall and constipation. These all sound like anticholinergic effects and I had mentioned it earlier, you want to avoid this in the elderly. Confusion and delirium, these medications, not only the medica medication, but they also, a lot of times, pain medicines come with active metabolites that are metabolized by the impaired liver that they already have. Or <coughs> they're excreted by the impaired kidney that they have. So if you have a double whammy with these with these agents, a great example is meparidine. So meparidine has an active metabolite that accumulates in patients with renal function, and an excess accumulation of this metabolite leads to seizures as well as delirium. So you do not use meparidine in the elderly. If you see that in a patient, I hope you guys <coughs> make a recommendation to switch that. So some of the drugs of choice to treat pain are the good old Tylenol, acetaminophen, 
Uh, but then you have to be worried about the maximum amounts that they can use because after four grams per day, you're looking at liver toxicity. <coughs> so everything has a really fine balance. There are other types of pain, including neuropathic pain. So this is the, the nerve damage pain, which is tingling or numbness, pins and needles. Opioids don't really have a role here. So you want to make sure that you use the treatment options I've listed there. This kind of pain usually presents due to a secondary disease state, such as diabetes or post-hepatic neuralgia. And so a lot of times, you know, you have to make sure that you have to make sure that you're not uh, treating, I'm sorry, I lost my chance. <laughs> you have to make sure that you're not uh, using the wrong agent to treat this condition. SNRIs are the treatment are the treatment options available. SNRIs are a good drug. I explained that they're used for depression as well as alternative agents. So here's another two birds with one stone because if you have a patient with diabetes and neuropathic pain, and then um, you have someone with depression or generalized anxiety, then you could use duloxetine or melanin. There are other agents, gabapentin and carbamazepine, they're anticonvulsants. I would steer away from them because gabapentin requir requires renal adjustments, requires frequent dosing like four times a day. Carbamazepine is a really bad drug for as far as drug interactions. It's a very potent inducer of other drugs and of itself. So, and then for gabalin, it's also available, but it's controlled substance. I try to steer away from controlled substances in the elderly. You can always supplement with Tylenol and uh, NSAID if needed. All right, when looking at chronic pain of degenerative joint disease, again, Tylenol and NSAIDs if needed, always try your non-pharmacological non therapies. Um, and then here are some NSAIDs listed. In the Beers criteria, it says, you know, avoid unless otherwise needed. So it, if, it, if this is the case and you've tried everything and your patient really is in pain, I, I mean, what are you left to do if they're immobile due to this pain? Then you're gonna have to end up prescribing some of this stuff. So just be careful with the doses. The beer stretcher also recommends that if you are going to prescribe an NSAID, that you should supplement it with uh, some sort of agent that prevents the uh, ulceration from forming, like um, prostaglandin agonist or proton pump inhibitors, which reduce the acid content in your stomach. And then there's all, always the topical formulations, but remember the issue with their skin permeability, and we have to always counsel them to wash their hands. All right, here's the patient sheet. AJ is an 86-year-old male who presents with symptoms, including confusion, memory deficits, and disorientation that started 10 hours ago. Medication, metoprolol, lisinopril, furosemide, meperidine, allopurinol, Advair, albuterol. MD wants to start the patient on medication for delirium. What do you recommend? I look at their urine analysis, I look for urine cultures, and 
hopefully their urine cultures were ordered before antibiotics were started in order to really tell if there's an infection in there or not. So just be mindful of these things. They don't present with the usual signs and symptoms that you and I would. And patients that reside in these type of locations, like uh, if they had recent hospitalizations, assisted living facility, or still nursing facility, they are going to have the, those multi-drug resistant organisms. And I have a picture here of methicillin resistant staph aureus, which is what I see all the time, every day. All right, moving on to constipation. We talked about anticholinergic drugs. So the major cause of constipation are medications. Diphenhydramine, again, Benadryl, opioids. That's your hydrocodone, your oxycodone, and any other anticholinergics that we've talked about. So make sure you look at these medications before you start prescribing stuff and always look at their diet. Elderly are naturally very much dehydrated. Dehydration equals constipation. Increase their fluid intake, as long as they don't have comorbidities that limit their fluid intake. And then also make sure they're active. At least just walking around the block will help. All right. do need to use medications for constipation, then the first line are your bulk agents or bulk laxatives. Um, so notorious, the ones you see at Walgreens all the time in the big orange box, Metamucil, Citrusel. They allow for that increased water absorption, which is what they need. And so now they have fecal mass in order to pass through. However, they have to use this slowly because they, they, they do cause abdominal distension if they use a large dose in flatulence. So one of the biggest counseling points that I have to tell them is, you know, use half a scoop today and then work your way up. Sometimes they just want a quick relief and they throw three, four scoops and then there's your problem. Be careful with laxatives, those strong laxatives, because they can cause electrolyte imbalance as well as medication interactions. Think about medications that may not be absorbed as quickly and then you're given a laxative. You're losing that effect. And then there are some other second line agents like polyethylene glycol or Miralax, lactulose, Subicol. There's a lot of brands out there. But remember, <coughs> both laxatives. And now moving on to urinary incontinence. So urinary incontinence is a lot of times due to aging. You lose that muscle tone. And women, you know, menopause, if you have hysterectomy, and there are medications that can also urinary incontinence for this specific indication or disease state this is the non-pharmacologic options are the go-to in the elderly because I'll tell you, one second so bladder training is important double voiding is important scheduled bathroom trips is important every single one point in there is important because if you do add a medication guess what you're adding you're adding anticholinergics, unfortunately. That is the first, those are the first line therapies when it comes to pharmacologic treatment options. So then you're at increased risk of anticholinergic burden. This is an additive effect. It doesn't mean that, oh, I get dry mouth. And you start getting dry everything. So think about that when you're prescribing uh, medications for your immune system. So the recommendation is just to avoid it period, if possible. Now let's talk about renal impairment. So renal impairment is decreased in the elderly and we've been talking about that a lot. Many medications do are dosed by renal function because if you don't, then they'll experience those related side effects. So you, you have to always make sure you check the renal status before and if you don't have your computer, now you know how to calculate it, so make sure you do. Um, a great example in the hospital. If they're hospitalized and bedridden, we always use medications for uh, deepening thrombosis prophylaxis so that they don't develop a <coughs> while they're in bed. So anoxaparin is an agent that is commonly used. However, it does require uh, dose adjustments because it is renally eliminated. So if the creatinine experience is greater than 30, usually they're dosed 40 milligrams subcutaneous daily, but if they fall below 30, then you have to adjust that to 30 subcutaneous daily. 
Now, enoxaparin can be used for other reasons, not just prophylaxis. You can actually treat an active CPT, but this is just an example. And I'm going to tell you a really sad story I experienced last week. I was uh, taking care of, I'm in antimicrobial stewardship right now, so my role as a pharmacist is to ensure optimal antibiotic usage, which means uh, duration of therapy, uh, correct route. You know, we don't want to leave IDs in there many, many days. We want to transition eventually to oral formulation. And that the agent is the adequate agent for the bacteria that we're treating. And so I was looking at a patient who came in and he had osteomyelitis, which is infection of the bone. And he had a creatinine of 0.4. It's an average granule for his age. He was 76. He is 76. And so based on his age and weight and all that, his renal function at the time was 76 ml per minute. Four days later, I kept following him. His creatinine kept bumping, bumping up. It went from 0.4, then 0.9. Then it went to 1.3, then it went to 3.5, and then it went to 5.6, and then it went all the way to 6. So his creatinine clearance within a four-day period went from 36 ml per minute to 11 ml per minute. You know why? His medications. He was receiving vancomycin, which is nephrotoxic, high dose. He was receiving NSAIDs and the methicin, full dose for an elderly, and he was ordered a CT uh, scan with contrast dye in it, just to add the whole thing. So we had an, we ended up having a patient with acute kidney injury, and last thing I read, he went into hemodialysis. It's very real and it's very sad. All right, commonly really renally adjusted medications are here for you: antibiotics, vancomycin, <coughs> hypoglycemic agents. Hypoglycemic agents. Be careful because. In the beers list, they discourage the use of glyburide because the patients are at increased risk of developing hypoglycemia because they're not renally eliminating the drug, so it stays in there. <coughs> New oral anticoagulants, enoxaparin, as we spoke about. Don't forget enoxaparin. And then analgesics, NSAIDs, famotidine, and gabapentin are some of the common ones. All right. So since you already know how to calculate a granny clearance, I gave it to you. JR is a 69-year-old male patient who's 69 inches tall and weighs 83 kilos. Granny is 0.8. Granny clearance is 87.1. JR was prescribed superavalent basal backup for suspected healthcare pneumonia. What dose do you recommend based on that real function? <coughs> Anybody notice anything 
out of whack in those flats. What do you think? The urine culture. Mm-hmm. So the urine cul culture has greater than 100,000 colony forming units for E. coli. She has a slightly elevated, or pretty elevated serum creatinine as well. Everything else looks pretty average for a person her age. So this is her medication regimen list right here and the indications. That's the first thing you want to do when looking at someone, someone's medication list. What are they currently taking and what are they taking it for? And what I can tell from this right here immediately is that there's two agents in there for insomnia right off the bat. So let's look at these individually, one by one. Let's look at her Alzheimer's. So you want to continue the exome path because <laughs> we have to treat the Alzheimer's. It's a cholinesterase inhibitor, and it is used for dementia. It's widely used, and it's good because it's a patch. The recommended dose is 9.5 milligrams per 24 hours of tolerated, and this is what she's on right now in, the, in that dose. So common side effects is nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and anorexia. Anorexia. <coughs> Caregiver says that she lost, she had, she's lost weight. Mm -hmm. So think about those things. Let's look at the depression. It said that they were being treated for depression with Abilify. Aripurprazole, it's an antipsychotic. What's the drug of choice to treat depression or the drug class of choice? SSRIs, that is not an SSRI. So think about the extra peripheral effects that she may be having or the so-called Parkinson's that she, is, she got diagnosed with three months ago. So then you would want to start an agent like centalogram, low dose, and then um, maximum is 40, just because of her age and risk of PT prolongation. Now let's look at the weight loss. So they started her on Megase because Megase is thought to increase patient's appetite. However, it's thought that it's minimally, minimally effective and it also increases the risk of thrombosis. And she's already residing in some long-term care facility, so I don't know if we don't know if her movement's that much or she's just physically active. And think about the side effects of the patch. So she's probably not hungry because of the patch. So she was on Reglan. Reglan methylcopramide is a prokinetic agent. And unfortunately, it does come with extra pyramidal side effects like the antipsychotics. And so now we're still adding to that Parkinson's movement disorder that she's having. And they possibly started it because she, had, she was experiencing that nausea and vomiting from the patch. So consider the dietary changes or possibly decreasing the dose of the patch. Now looking at the, car, uh, the Parkinson's, they started treating this supposed uh, Parkinson's that she has now with carbidopa, levodopa, cinnamon. It's a gold standard drug to use in Parkinson's. Um, but we just talked about that those Parkinson's symptoms are likely due to the antipsychotic or the methylcopramide. So why don't we just discontinue that cinnamon and reevaluate her diagnosis in a few months once we have all those medications out of her system? And as far as her insomnia, Tylenol PM has acetaminophen and diphenhydramine in it. Think about the anticholinergic effects with Benadryl. And this could have had contributed to her memory loss and residual drowsiness and increased risk of fall. Let's continue on Prazolam. She was also on her Prazolam because again, we're treating the same indication twice. And as I mentioned, we don't want benzodiazepines in the elderly because they're at an increased risk of fall. Educated patient on sleep hygiene. It might do wonders. And then looking at the UTI, you guys saw that she had E. coli. <coughs> However, she was being treated with nitroferontoin or macrobid. When you look at the package insert or micrometics or whatever source you use, you will want to avoid this drug in patients with creatinine clearance less than 60. Hers was 33. So because this is not even concentrating in her urine, killing the bacteria, so she still has an active infection and she's still getting the drugs and she's still going to get these side effects. So why don't we switch her to Bactrim yet, which is a good agent based on her renal function it's dosed twice daily, and she only has to take it for three days. Short term, easy to take. So looking at her old medication,
medications when she start when she came to see you to the new medications were less than three and we're still addressing every single problem she had. So this is what we do as pharmacists. So when in doubt, call us. <laughs> All right, so I wanna finish this lecture with this quote. Any symptom in an elderly patient should be considered a drug side effect as so proven otherwise. Thank you so much. Here are my references. And I'll take any questions. Um, but before that, just some FYI. In my test question, you won't need to know brands. Just know the generic names and the drugs we talked about in the lecture. You won't need to know doses. I've provided that for you. I'm, I'm not a big fan of having to memorize doses because we have advanced technology nowadays and we can just always pull it up when you're dealing with a dose adjustment. And then remember, you do need to know the Cochrane-Bell formula. I will provide the weight for you so that you're able to calculate it effectively. And please write down my email. Uh, email me with any questions you have between now and your test date or after the test. We can clarify any uh, issues that you may come across. And that's it. Thank you guys for hanging in there with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.